Um, yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I also wanted to start by acknowledging my collaborators on the experimental work that I'll be describing uh, this morning. Okay, so the question in the air this morning is, uh, what's drawing and why do we do it? Well, we've certainly been at it for a long time. Pictorial systems of representation precede written language by at least a healthy 25,000 years, and thus are among the first examples of cognitive technologies humans have devised to encode their thoughts outside themselves. Drawings are pervasive across cultures and are produced prolifically by children today. So what might explain the popularity and longevity of this particular technique? Well, for one, drawings work. We've seen several examples of that already. A classic finding is that a caricature can even be more effective than a vertical photo for evoking the identity of a face. It's one of JFK. They're also very efficient. You may only need a few simple strokes to capture a complex event structure, as in a football play. Moreover, drawings endure. A spoken word fades as soon as it is uttered. Gestures, which are spontaneously used to augment, modify, or substitute for spoken utterances, are similarly fleeting. But unlike our private mental images, drawings are visible to everyone and can be shared and further modified by others. You lost your image. Yeah. I did. Well, actually, I didn't. This is actually a blank one. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> so what's happening when we? Do this? <laughs> yeah, that's happening when we we don't have these external media to support our thinking. What's happening when we do draw? Um, well, for one, it's a very direct way of revealing the structure of our mental representations. And in the process of doing so, it may even alter those representations. My goal in this talk is to lay out an approach to studying drawing as a form of cognitive technology that is both rooted in biological endowments, in terms of brain organization, and yet over historical time has given rise to a flowering of visualization techniques for economically constructing durable representations that we've now come to use in so many ways. I'm gonna begin by describing an approach we've developed to quantitatively characterize the internal representation recruited when we draw, leveraging insights from the computational neuroscience of natural vision. Next, I'll review some empirical findings from experiments we've recently conducted to interrogate how practice communicating visual concepts can promote learning. And finally, I'll articulate a way forward for deepening our understanding of drawing as one among a suite of complementary graphical techniques that support thinking, communication, and discovery. First up, natural vision. So what underlies our ability to place strokes on the page, what I'm gonna call visual production, such that someone can recognize what we're trying to convey? <clears throat> to gain traction on this question, we began with the premise that visual production and its complement, visual recognition, are linked through some common internal substrate. We hypothesize that a good candidate for this common substrate might be one we already know to represent visual information at a fairly abstract level. From what we have learned about the organization of the primate visual system, we thought a likely candidate for this shared representation might lie at an advanced stage in the ventral visual stream, a set of hierarchically organized brain regions along which simple visual features encoded in the lowest area, V1, such as orientation and spatial frequency, are combined and transformed in such a way as to support object identification and categorization at the top level of the hierarchy in inferior temporal cortex, or IT. Our goal here was to characterize the abstract representation that serves both visual recognition and production. Operationally, we wanted to determine the feature similarity between sketches and natural photorealistic inputs when using features that we already know support visual abstraction. So we assembled a set of images containing a large number of sketches produced by non-experts and photos of objects from 147 basic level categories. Here are just some examples. Now, one way to measure high level visual similarity might be to record neural activity in ventral temporal cortex, say by presenting sketches and photorealistic images to a person lying in an fMRI scanner and monitoring activity in their brain. We took a different approach that had some other nice advantages. We presented the various images to uh, this recently developed convolutional neural network, whose architecture was modeled on the ventral visual stream and has previously been shown to achieve human level performance on object recognition, just on photos, as well as produce output 
that approximates neural population responses in high-level visual areas, intermediate areas including D4, just before IT, and IT. We could then measure model output at the highest layer and use this as a proxy for the neural representation in IT. Now, this particular model had only been optimized to recognize objects in photos and had never been exposed to a sketch or line drawing prior to this step. So in addition to being a kind of economical alternative to recording from neurons, using this model also allowed us to test related and deep questions about the necessity of specific experience with certain image modalities, for example sketches, in order to arrive at a good representation of them. We hypothesize that insofar as similar computations underlie the formation of object of abstract representations of object identity when confronted with a photorealistic image or a simple sketch, the feature representation would be comparable between these two modalities. Now, each image elicits an output pattern at each layer in the model, which can be expressed as a kind of location in a high dimensional feature space. Now this output pattern you can kind of think of as like a neural fingerprint for that image. And together these locations will yield a map of objects for each image domain. And this is a, a kind of visualization of the map for sketches after applying some clustering to show how visually similar objects are grouped together in representation. It's kind of hard to look at. There are lots of dots, so I color coded some of them. So you can see that um, some uh, sensible groupings have come out here. Bear in mind this model was never trained to put buses and trucks and trains together. It's grouped them because these are abstractly similar in terms of their shape, as well as these kind of round organic objects, apple, tomato, and pumpkin. Now, this map, kind of difficult to look at, so we can unroll it into a correlation matrix in which each cell represents the distance between a given pair of objects in that map I just showed you. Okay, so here's that very same map, now in matrix form. Each of the objects are on the rows and the columns. Notice the blue blocks along the diagonal. This is that cluster structure I mentioned a moment ago. So these cooler colors mean that objects here are nearby, and the red sort of blocks you can see on the off diagonal show that these clusters are <coughs> tightly closer together, and they have similar distances from each other, cross clusters. But more to the point, the same kind of higher order cluster structure appears to be shared across image domains using this high level feature representation. Here, quantified by the similarity uh, of these two matrices, this is a Spearman rate correlation between them. And what this shows is that the overall representation of object categories is actually quite similar for photos and sketches. And it is precisely this commonality that may underlie the fact that we can recognize a, a line drawing of an elephant, a photo of an elephant, with no problem at all, despite large physical differences between photos and line drawings. By contrast, this similarity between maps was negligible at the first layer in the model, showing that low-level local image features, say edges alone, are unlikely to support the kind of visual abstraction that serves both visual recognition and production. Okay, so building a system only optimized to handle natural image variation in photos set it up to also recognize line drawings without having to posit any new specialized mechanisms, suggesting that the capacity for visual abstraction may actually be rooted in the functional architecture of the primate visual system. Conveniently for our purposes, this result also set us up to now use this model as a tool to understand how drawing might mediate visual learning. Okay, so how might drawing objects influence the presentation of objects in the mind? Well, perhaps practice drawing allows one to learn the diagnostic features that better communicate the identity of an object. And this practice might improve one's ability to make recognizable drawings that distinguish it from other similar objects. To address this, we set up a game for people to play in which they communicated visual concepts to an artificial agent by drawing. In this case, perhaps a sheep. The kinds of concepts people were asked to draw were a subset of the objects from our previous analysis. There were 64 objects in total, actually, eight different visual categories. Here are the columns containing eight objects each on the rows, and these are they. After participants would make a drawing, the artificial agent, here presented by this blue avatar, 
would try to guess what the player had intended to draw. We set this game up on Amazon Mechanical Turk. This is an online labor market um, that allowed us to collect a large and diverse sample from around the world. Um, I'm going to show you a demo video of three drawing trials from the perspective of a participant, sped up about four times, okay? So first up is pineapple. Yay, three stars. <laughs> oh, I missed that one. But you can see the kinds of errors that it's making. Will it say fish? Oh. Close. Okay, so this is a, this is a sort of flavor of like what participants would experience in performing this task. Across trials, we asked them to practice drawing some of these objects more, and then we measured how well they were later able to draw those practice objects relative to control ones, and found that even this fairly brief training intervention, about 25 minutes, produced measurable improvement in their drawings. So um, a downward going bar on this graph would represent improvement, and it actually made their drawings more recognizable than before. Learning was measured using the output from a multi-way linear classifier, trained on the artificial agents, top layer representation of each sketch. Just to remind you, here's a picture of the architecture of that agent who scored these sketches. It's the very same neural network from before. Next, we wondered what the source of that improvement was. In other words, which aspects of the drawing task had contributed to this learning? So we had a second group repeat the same sessions the drawing group had done, except instead of drawing, they watched a stroke-by-stroke -stroke replay of what one of the original participants had drawn. This intervention was a bit weaker, but still produced reliable improvement. So they drew the beginning and the end, but ordinarily when they would have practiced drawing these objects repeatedly, they would just watch. And you still saw reliable improvement, just from observation of someone else. But if you took away that dynamic stroke level information, then people didn't improve. Now, this was again from a cohort that was yoked to the original session, but they only saw the final sketch produced by the original participant as a static image, and they didn't learn. So we found that dynamic visual feedback is sufficient to improve drawing performance. To scrutinize these results further, we extracted high-level visual features from the original sketches using the same convolutional neural network. What I'm showing here in matrix form is a time course of the feature distance between successive drawings of the same object. And um, the increasing gray tinge as you move across the diagonal toward the bottom right indicates that sketch output became less variable as training progressed, consistent with some kind of tightening in the sketch representation of the object. So naturally, this made us wonder. The sketch readout from these object representations is getting cleaner or sharper somehow. But if it's a case that the underlying object representation had also been refined, then this effect should generalize to a different task, say one involving recognition rather than production. Specifically, if what people were learning were those distinguishing features that made one object what it was and not some other, this might help them resolve ambiguous cases more consistently. So recall that there are 64 objects used in the previous study. And these objects form natural groupings based on visual similarity. These groupings led to some interesting and systematic patterns in the recognition errors made by other people looking at these sketches. What I'm showing you here is a confusion matrix over all 64 objects. The red stripe along the diagonal indicates that most of the time, people were getting them right. And the whitish blocks on the diagonal, hugging the diagonal, show the structure of people's errors. The most salient of these blocks included objects that roughly corresponded to the superordinate categories, furniture, quadruped animals, and vehicles. Now, since our next step involved taking more perceptual measurements, we thought it would make sense to focus on these high density clusters containing objects that people had struggled to differentiate in their drawings, since there might be more room to go there to look at learning. So we built some 3D mesh models of furniture and cars. Actually, not quite us. Um, Lauren Kay, a Brooklyn-based science animator, created them. So here's a, here's a shout out to her. This is her work. Now, why did we do this? Well, the key reason, so the picture we had in our minds of what these representations are like 
has them as these kind of point clouds embedded in a high dimensional feature space. And the confusable objects are the ones whose clouds or densities overlap, at least to some extent. So we needed a way of probing the representational space continuously between similar objects. Space that isn't necessarily populated with natural objects that we can simply point to in the real world. Moreover, these meshes give us physical ground truth, so we could ground people's subjective reports <coughs> in objective measures. Now, this was a constraint we had imposed in advance of producing the eight meshes you saw two slides ago, um, that we could smoothly interpolate between these endpoints. In this case, between bed and chair to get varieties of bears and, and cheds. And not just cheds and bears, but all the hybrids connecting pairs of objects within these two categories. Now, the task we had people do now was dead simple. We showed them these objects and also lots of morphs between them, and then just asked them to tell us what they saw, choosing between two labels. Here's an example file. What was that? <laughs> chair, maybe? Okay, yeah, it's like a wide chair, right? Okay, they did uh, many such recognition trials, both before and after sketch training, where they were shown morphs that were often ambiguous and from a variety of different viewpoints. Each participant was assigned at random two disjoint pairs from one category. So one of these axes would be trained, and then the other axis would be the control. During the training phase, people practiced drawing the endpoint objects from the trained pair. And each trial would begin the three second presentation of one of these objects. That portion of the display was replaced with a drawing canvas, and they could take as long as they wanted to make their sketch. Most completed their drawings in 30 seconds or less. And here are just a few examples of what people drew based on HQ. I just really appreciated that one. <laughs> the, <plugs. laughs> the logic was that reinforcing the unambiguous, canonical versions of these objects would encourage people to learn those distinguishing features that really made one object what it was, and not the other, and thus help them resolve these ambiguous cases. Now, how would you measure this? We exploited the fact that we had collected recognition measurements along the physical interpolation between endpoint objects. For example, for the bed chair axis, we calculated the proportion of trials that they labeled a given morph as a chair, from something that's very not chair-like at all, it's a bed, something that it looks exactly like a canonical chair. <laughs> and then to these data, we fit an S-shaped function, <coughs> which allowed us to estimate both a threshold parameter, the point at which people are just as likely to say it's a bed or a chair, as well as a slope parameter, where the steepness represents the discriminability, especially where these decisions are the hardest at the inflection point. And we hypothesized that if drawing is really sharpening the representation of these endpoint objects, then we should be able to measure this using the slope parameter. The trained slope should increase. Okay, so what I'm plotting here on the y-axis is a change in slope between the pretest and the post-test for the trained control conditions. What we found is that the slope actually had grown steeper for the trained axis. Error bars here are 95% confidence intervals, suggesting that some aspect of the training while only at the endpoints, had led to sharper discrimination across morphs. Now what happened with the control axis? Now it might be the case that generic exposure to cars is enough to lead to some kind of generalized ability to separate out ambiguous hybrid cars, but we didn't see that, the same kinds of changes. So taken together, these results show that a selective effect of drawing practice on the trained axis. Now this result was really intriguing, but we couldn't be sure how much was carried by the drawing task itself since people also had more exposure to the objects from the trained axis, although not the morphs and never from the same viewpoints. We set up a variant of the training procedure that was just like the dynamic observation condition from the previous study, in which participants, new group of participants, viewed a stroke-by-stroke -stroke replay of how one of the original participants had made their sketch. Okay, I'd like to emphasize that it wouldn't necessarily be surprising if we saw that people also learned in this observation condition because they're receiving exactly the same visual exposure. And this is basically what basically every visual perceptual learning study provides, lots of visual experience. 
Instead, we found that slopes didn't budge in this observation condition. And what this suggests is that observing these stroke, the stroke dynamics of sequence wasn't sufficient for inducing the same kind of learning measured in the drawing case. Now, stepping back, I think these findings, these preliminary findings are really promising as we are trying to gain a clear understanding of how action and perception are so intimately related to one another when we draw, and how dynamic and constructive behaviors such as drawing can play an important role in perceptual learning. And more broadly, I hope that these controlled laboratory studies help us understand how drawing and seeing work in concert to aid learning in the real world. So some drawings are decorative, of course, but many others serve as tools of discovery and have done so throughout the history of science. It's a tool of thought and observation, a way of making patterns and variation visible by marking them clearly on the page. In the case of the earliest observations of nebulae, Drawing was actually critical for making it possible to see what could not be or barely resolved through a telescope. So this is from a catalog, this is a page from um, a catalog of um, nebulae published by William Herschel, in the early 19th century. John Wool's iconic drawings of the, the finches Darwin had observed on the Galapagos Islands helped to make variation in beak structure clear, which paved the way for identifying natural selection as a potential latent cause of this variation. And I thought the neuroscientists and other brain-minded folks here might appreciate a shout out to Ramon Cajal, his famous histological drawings. Here's a cross-section of the retina. In the life sciences, especially, especially image making and drawing in particular has long been recognized to play an important role in organizing scientific knowledge and transmitting this knowledge to students in the next generation. Intuitively, Drawing appears to be well suited to encouraging students to move beyond initial assumptions about how certain animals or plants look, to concentrate on the actual properties of the actual specimen in front of them. Core skills for understanding structure, variation, function. However, the empirical literature on observational drawing in classroom settings suggests that such potential benefits are far from automatic. In one landmark study, middle schoolers first read a passage about the nervous system. Some only did that. Others made drawings about what they'd read. A third group drew, then compared what they'd drawn to some reference illustrations. And the fourth group drew, compared what they'd drawn to the reference illustrations in the context of guiding questions that directed their attention to the most details, the most important details to compare. Later, all students were tested on um, what they had learned from that chapter. The students who not only drew, but were also guided by the questions to make specific comparisons between their drawings and the reference drawings could recall more about the biological structure that they'd read about than the other groups, even though all the conditions actually involved processing the illustrations in some form. This advantage was present across the board for even more abstract content, suggesting the important role of instructor guidance and feedback in helping students learn as much as they can for producing, from producing their own representations of the material. Okay, and turning to the closing section of my talk, I'll say up that my comments here will be more speculative and more question marks. Um, they'll be kind of more of an outline for a way forward than, than summarizing uh, findings. So the central premise of, uh, in this talk is that drawing is a cognitive technology and a highly successful one at that. In addition to helping us observe and learn about the immediate world around us, drawings are a vehicle by which our thoughts may travel many miles, many generations away from where we first had them. They have helped us to discover mathematics, written language, and anticipate the built world. And if we take seriously the idea that drawing is at its core a cognitive technology, then what an amazing array of ways we have to draw today My basic stance here is that there needn't be a fundamental difference between drawing by hand and drawing by machine in the way that these activities support our long range goals, but that in order to bridge current gaps between traditional and more modern drawing technologies, we will need a principled and quantitative understanding of the cognitive and neural mechanisms that enable manual drawing 
and why it is so powerful. Now here are some examples of exciting frontiers where the way we draw and see have propelled or are poised to propel us to innovate new graphical techniques. Uh, first, what I'll call discovery. Now William Playfair drew this map famously in 1786, except instead of tracing out rivers over land, across space, it displays British international trade patterns over time. And we've been drawing time series plots ever since. Now here's a more recently made map of global temperatures for each month on the x-axis. For every year, this will be an animation in time, between the years 1880 and 2014. Now, while not drawn by hand, they honor Playfair's legacy by enlarging the scope of what we can discover by sifting through and reorganizing our observations. All basically what we've been doing all along on paper, but with the cost of each drawing so low, there are new opportunities for iteration. And this is exactly how scientists of today learn to draw with data, with powerful quantitative plotting tools and a standard suite of graphical conventions designed to promote statistical inference. A question I hope that future research in the cognitive and computer science of visualization will address is what will our tools of discovery look like in the future? How can we make these tools more intuitive and accessible, allowing more people to learn more by producing visualizations of information for themselves? <laughs> now drawings are also used to communicate and thus are intentionally selective. Effective ones emphasize content that's relevant to the topic at hand and omit irrelevant details. <clears throat> What principles can we infer from the way people spontaneously visually communicate to build better digital tools that support communication? Now, when we use Google Maps to navigate somewhere new, we might say something like this, which is okay for telling you that you'll be spending a lot of time on the highway, but not great if you want to know which turns you'll need to take when you get closer to your destination. By contrast, the ad hoc route maps that people draw to give driving directions typically trace out routes at multiple scales simultaneously magnifying segments of the route with many turns and contracting longer route segments. While not strictly accurate, such maps are more legible because they better mirror how people think about routes. Starting with the Line Drive Project in 2001, Manish Agarwala and colleagues have been developing algorithms that procedurally generate route maps that look much more like the kinds we might sketch to give to a friend. Thus, here's another very exciting frontier, to my mind. How can we use communicative drawings to infer principles that govern how really informative visualizations work? Implementing these in software may make it easier to find what we're looking for, understand how something works, and get to where we need to go. Design sketches are proposals not for what is, but for what could be. As everyone in this room well appreciates, the architect and the engineer and designer's drawing board is the, is the wellspring of the, of the built world around us. And virtually all designed objects began as ambiguous, untidy, fragmentary sketches full of indeterminate contours, smudges, erasures, blank space. Sketching is this iterative technique for low cost exploration of design possibilities, one that can lead to surprising results, as well as guide a designer towards more concrete proposals. And at the same time, we're observing marvelous advances in the field of procedural modeling an approach to generating very detailed design proposals without having to invest costly human effort. <clears throat> a third exciting challenge. How can we leverage quantitative understanding of how designers use sketches and prototypes to develop tools that allow future designers to explore and evaluate alternatives more effectively? Okay, so to sum up. I told you about an approach to investigating drawing that is grounded in our state of our <coughs> understanding of visual recognition, and argue that the intersection between these two forms of sophisticated visual cognition may lie in high-level visual cortex. Establishing this link allowed us to investigate the consequences of drawing practice. We found that such practice led to more differentiated sketches and enhanced people's ability to make fine perceptual discriminations. I gesture at connections to finding from the educational literature on how drawing, coupled with structured feedback and guidance, can enhance learning in real world learning environments. And finally, I sketch an outline for a path forward for applying what we learn in studying sketching, that most basic visualization technique, in order to develop graphical tools that can further extend the human mind and hand. All right, 
Thank you all.